Greetings and salutations, there's the volume, and welcome to Deliver It. This is an Agile Product Owners Podcast. My name is Corey Bryan, and over there, in the sunshine, Cameron Trakaitis. Hello! Yes, the sunshine it is. Yeah. It is so hot outside. I don't want to be in the sunshine. I don't want to be outside. No. I just want to be in my car, or in my office, I want to get house. my vitamin D in a pill, please. <laughs> you know my dog, the big fluffy one? Uh-huh. He will be so happy if he can lay outside all day long in the sun. I'm like, Dill. No. Your, his little nose is getting all burned. No. <laughs> Let's put suntan lotion on his nose let him sit outside. Ugh. It's crazy. No. No. Yeah, no. No, thank you. I agree. Well, other than the sun. Yeah. Have you gotten back into the swing of things? I have. Yeah? Yep. Everything is back to normal. As far as I know, we are wrapping up a release at work, so we're dealing with a lot of defect fixes. Mm -hmm. Defects. Uh, Yeah, and I'm starting to get the the requirements together for the next release, which is great. This is actually very soon in the process, so Mm -hmm. that makes me very happy. That's good. Yeah, so it's uh, it's going swimmingly. Yes. How about you? What's happening? Uh, Well, let's see what's happening. Um, Trying to do some type of internal product launch. Okay. So we've got one of the students thing. I mentioned it before that yep. we're trying to launch it and we're actually getting somewhere now. So we've got some beta tests going on with some, some groups and starting to get some feedback. One of the things we're putting in right now is some metrics mm-hmm. so that we can see what people are actually doing versus what they say they're doing. So transparency. I want, I want both. Of course. I want, I really like this when I do this and then go to the data and go, Oh, they're, they're really doing that. Mm-hmm. Or look at the data and go, somebody's doing something here. I need to go ask why. So I want to use both of them. Um, but that's very high on my priority list is to get those metrics in. So we're working on that. Our, that is exciting. Some folks are doing that. Are so, the yeah. students excited? Well, it's not the students anymore. They're oh. done. Oh, this is, we're trying to bring it in and oh, actually use it. Oh, okay. So it's actually volunteers that we have. Are the volunteers um, excited? Yes. Yes. They're, they're, and they're learning too. So, mm-hmm. I mean, they're getting something out of it. It's a new technology for them and they're going to use it in their next project and they're actually learning about it doing this project. So Very yeah, cool. it's a win-win. Yeah. I like win-wins. It's very innovative. I hope so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very nice. So I finished another book. Of course you did. <laughs> How do you find all this time to read? Well, I'm not going to give away the secret. <laughs> There's a secret to reading? There's a secret to reading. Or defining the time to read? <laughs> yes. It's uh-huh. the, time. the time. It's not the, the, the reading itself, because I, I like to read, but mm-hmm. it's finding the time to read. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. But this was a very good book, and it was a very quick book for me. Um, it's Kathy Sierra, uh, and it's called Badass, Making Users Awesome. Okay. Uh, she did a talk, and I'm hoping the talk is going to be up online pretty soon at the uh, Mind the Product Conference in San Francisco. Uh, and I think it was a 45 minute talk where she talked similar to this. The book is a very quick read. It's not, you know, 360 pages of wall to wall text. It's a lot of graphics, a lot of information, a lot of chart type stuff. Um, but the book is very good. It's, it's talking about how to focus, how to help the users be awesome instead of don't talk about your tool. Your tool is not awesome. Nobody cares about your tool. Nobody cares that they can use Photoshop. They care what they can do with Photoshop and the things that they can do. And there, there's a lot of that psychology um, in the first part of the book about how do you break that barrier? How do you turn the focus from, uh, you know, the marketing when you're marketing something like a, a camera? Uh, how do you turn the focus from marketing to the camera from the user guide of the tool of, you know, here's how you click this button to get this shutter speed. Nobody cares about that. What they care about is they can make awesome photos and they can edit those photos and get them out to your friends. And that's where the book talks a lot about that. And it's really cool. It, it, you know, the context that you're in, if you're in photography, talk about the context. If you're in um, financing, talking about the context of financing, don't talk about the tool that allows you to do those things. Uh, It gives you a way to kind of show them a path to success and what's going to pull them off. What's going to derail them off of that path. It's really good. Uh, and ways to kind of break down skills and learning activities into small chunks so they can become automatic and other things that they need to learn and work at. So some things are going to get real quick and some things you're going to have to learn about. I um, mean, it's about how to build that type of a program. And it's really cool. Really good idea. Um, we'll have a link to that book, but I, I, I'm going to have to read that book again at some point. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we'd give a shout out to Kathy Sierra for this one. Yes. I'd like to read that. That sounds really good. It, I'll, I'll let you borrow my copy. If, right. 
Right. Well, as you know, I don't really have a lot of free time to read. <laughs> just, so maybe, hey, Kathy, can you put it out on, um, I don't know, what's it called when you when you listen to it? Audiobook. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, can you put it on audiobook, please? Maybe a podcast. Our, our podcast would be fantastic. <laughs> so I haven't read any books recently, but I did watch a TED Talk, which I've actually seen before. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. it's um, Daniel Pink. And he does a TED Talk called The Puzzle of Motivation. And my team recently has seemed to be a little bit less than motivated. They seem kind of bummed. Mm -hmm. So I want to review his TED Talk to see if, you know, maybe there's something I can pick up, maybe some tips and hints. Right. But basically he talks about how financial incentives actually result in a negative impact on performance and that people really aren't motivated by money. Right. Which – in a, in a certain context, is true, right? Certain. In a certain context. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things he talks about is if it's, if it's creative or if it's, you know, just do A, B, C, then there's profit and, or you can see how things are incentivized that way. But if it's creative, if it's a knowledge worker type thing, which is what we deal with mm -hmm. most of the time with people trying to solve problems creatively, how do you deal with that? How do you incentivize those? Right. He talked about that people want to do things because they matter. So there's a sense of, you know, having them direct their own lives, mm -hmm. having them get better at something that matters, and then fulfilling some sort of internal purpose that they have. And that's what motivates. Yeah. So, I like yes, that. I, I agree with yeah. all those, those three. Absolutely, I agree with it. And that's referring to people that are already internally motivated. If, cause there yeah. are times when people just want money and, and that, well, they're that's not true. motivated by anything else. That's true. That's the intrinsic versus extrinsic. Motivations right. and the intrinsic ones that he talks about, the autonomy, mastery, and purpose, those are the way that people get motivated. And honestly, and, and one of the things he says in there is once you take money off the table, once money isn't an issue, you pay somebody what they're worth, right. so that's not an issue. What they value at that point is not more money, although they certainly would take it. What they value at that point is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Give me something to work for. Let me do it and let me figure out how the best way to do it is. And I, I really like that model. But it's something that a lot of companies don't get. And that was one of his things that he was talking about too. It, com new companies or old companies that are hiring workers in this day and age to do this work don't understand this yet. Right. And he also talks about dangling the carrot and beating, beating people with sticks. Yeah. What do you say? A sweeter carrot or a sharper stick? Right. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Sticks and carrots don't work. No. I don't like carrots. I love carrots. Or sticks. I don't care for sticks. <laughs> okay. I definitely like a good carrot. All right. Um, so yeah, it's, it was actually an interesting, um, Ted talk. He, you know, I like about what I like about him is that he's very animated mm -hmm. and enthusiastic and he engages the audience. Yeah, he's a very good speaker. He's a really good speaker. Yeah. And he, his book, I have not read yet. I need to. It's on my wish list to drive. It's the same type of thing. He's talking about motivation. Yep. So, so we should also add that to our list of resources. Yes. We will mm -hmm. add it to the show notes. So thanks, Daniel Pink. Yes, and then we have our topic that we're going to talk about today. Our topic today. And that is, is roadmaps. Roadmaps. All right, so roadmaps. What is a roadmap, Corey? Well, when you want to get from point A to point B, you use Google Maps. No. Um, a or road like old map, school maps of the paper yeah, the that, that you can never quite fold right, right ever again. You can get it unfolded and it's never going and back. And then you just crumble it up and throw it in the back seat. That's right. Is um, that what we're referring to? We say no, road maps? No, 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 no. <laughs> so a roadmap and an agile team and in a product owner sense, what we're doing is we're showing where we're going um, at a very high level. And I mean super high level. So this is in the next couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of releases, whatever our timeline is. This is the direction we're headed. These are the things we're hoping to accomplish, or these are the directions that we're set out um, to tackle in the next couple months. So we put them on something that we can share. Um, it's changeable. It's not. This is not our commitment for the next, you know, eighteen months or whatever it is. This is what we think and what we want to talk about going forward. Um, so it's a very high level plan. And again, I'll say. Plans are useless. Planning is somewhat helpful. So we planned out, we've done some planning, and this is what we came up with, and we expect it to change in the future, but this is the direction we're headed off in. So we're headed east. Go. We're not just driving, you know, willy-nilly. We're headed east or west or whichever direction we're headed. That's right. the direction we're headed. And you're not committing to anything. So you may no. be heading east, but there could be a chance that you're going to decide you're going to go north. At some point, yeah, down. sure. 
Because so the road changed. The right? road changed, right? Yeah. So it's just it's just the direction. It's not a commitment. And I think we need to reiterate that probably several times over. Yeah. That the roadmap doesn't mean you're getting a, this stuff. This is just where we're heading. Yeah. So it's just a plan. Just an idea. And there's several I've, – I've used to do my roadmaps based on features. Mm-hmm. So feature A, feature B, this is going to be in this release. This will be in this release, You know, whatever it is. Um, I've changed my mind and my approach. I like putting outcomes on the roadmaps now more than I do features. So instead of seeing, saying feature A in this quarter, I'm going to say users can use Visa or users can do something. What outcome am I hoping to get out of that feature? Because that's more important to my business and my users than just feature A. Feature A is just boring. It's just sitting there. But the outcome that they get from that feature is much more important. But by putting users can use Visa, that's pretty vague and that could be – construed in any way how is that vague well i mean use visa what, what does that really mean that they can pay for things with a visa card okay but can they do other things with a visa card if i were looking at the roadmap Probably. i'd think oh they can do everything they want to do with the visa card because that's on the roadmap yeah i'm just saying no i, I mean it's a valid point but i mean I'm, and i'm my terrible example there but it's about what do we want the users to accomplish once we deliver this versus just delivering a feature? Mm-hmm. What do we hope to get? What kind of metric are we looking for after we deliver this feature? And that's where you put the outcomes in and all the features that you're putting in meet that outcome. That's what you're driving toward is the outcome instead of just the output, which is just the features. And I like that idea. I haven't done it yet, um, but I like that idea. And the next roadmap that I create, I am definitely going to switch that to have outcomes and it's okay to still have features on there, Mm -hmm. especially if they're, they're big features or something specific that either are technology driven or something else. But I like the idea of outcomes on a roadmap. Okay. I'm thinking more like your outcomes are, it's kind of your epic level. I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, features would be to me would be like the story level, Mm -hmm. right. Or theme level. And then above that, you'd have your epic But you're actually going a step above the epic? Yeah. The the value that we're delivering for this epic theme or group of stories, whatever we're doing, what is the value we're hoping to get out of that? That's what you put on the roadmap Mm. instead of just the story or just the epic. What are we going to get? What is the business going to be able to use or the user is going to be able to do once they get this item off the roadmap? Business value. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's one idea. I mean, I, I there's lots of people that still do features on roadmaps, which is still okay. But I like the idea of putting outcomes on there. Right, and that's the cool thing about these tools and stuff that we do. And it, it doesn't have to follow a strict standard. No, no, no. You know, you try, you try, and if it works, you keep yeah. doing it. If it doesn't work, you try something different. You learn, you try something else. Absolutely, cool. So we talked about how it's it's just the direction. Yeah. There are no commitments. Um, and I guess we do f- technology and we focus on the product. So it can contain both. Yeah, both technology features and business and product features. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, I've definitely put on. So if you've got a big Oracle upgrade coming up or you've got a technology switchover that you're going to do, definitely make it part of your roadmap. Because, again, one of the things we want to do as product vendors is show all the work that we have to do, that the teams have to do to be able to release something. And if you've got a big technology upgrade it needs to be part of your roadmap. Right. And again, it's going to eat up resources. So we need to make, make that visible. Right. That those work isn't going to be done by some ghost in the corner. Do we have ghosts in the corner? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Is that who's been screwing up the build machine? <laughs> the ghost in the and corner. And eating all my cookies? <laughs> ghost in the corner. So we don't, definitely don't want to confuse a backlog with a roadmap. These terms are not interchangeable. Right. And I mean, they're two different things, but they complement each other. They do. So your items that are on your roadmap should be items that are in your backlog. As epics and stories and and themes and whatever else. The high level concept is your roadmap. And then you start getting more specific and epics can be specific or they could be, depending on how far away they are, um, they could be big ideas for epics or they could be a little bit more um, thought out if you've gone through and broken them down a little bit. Yeah, but just because we have a backlog doesn't mean we get to skip the roadmap. Just because we have a roadmap doesn't mean we can skip putting epics into right. the backlog. Yep. That's very true. Yep. Um, so I like simple. 
especially when it comes to roadmaps, because you're talking concepts. We're not talking, and again, to get away from that, it's not the plan that we're, and it's not a project plan. So let's not do it so it looks like a Gantt chart. Let's not make it look like I a waterfall. I know you love Gantt charts. Oh, God. They drive me crazy. <laughs> Those little tiny triangles all over the place. Milestone one, milestone 46, and at some point we get to deliver something. No, stop it. Um, so yeah, don't make it look like a Gantt chart. Uh, I am big on one page. A lot of things that I'm doing as a product owner are one page. So if I've got a problem statement or if I've got uh, a charter or if I've got a roadmap or if I've got something that I need to explain to somebody, I better be able to explain it simply and very quickly. So for a roadmap, I want one page, and it has to fit on one page. Um, when I say it doesn't look like a Gantt chart, it's not a waterfall, right? It doesn't go and uh, cascade down. It's got five or six lines, horizontal lines, and then it's got an item across the time frame, and then you skip a little bit, and then you've got another item on that same line. So it's, it's stacked. Um, I've seen it several times where they've broken up. We talked about business and technical. Uh, I've seen several times where you've broken swim lanes. And so you've had your business features and your technical features. And both of those are on your roadmap. They're broken up, but you can see when each of them is coming in. Yeah. And if, you know, for the audience, our listeners, if you go to product roadmap on Google and look at images, there's a variety of different ways yeah. that you can create your roadmap, depending on what you want, what works best, what do you like. I was looking at Roman Pitchler. Pitchler he recommends um, certain information that you add to the roadmap. So he talks about adding dates. So when is the release available? He says that we should add the names of the product version or the release, the goal. So what is being developed? It's kind of like what you were just talking about a minute mm-hmm. ago. He also talks about features. So adding what, you know, describing what's necessary to create in order to meet the goal. And then he also includes a line for metrics. So what KPIs will be used to determine if the goal has been met. So Roman also includes a really good sample uh, roadmap on his site. So it's www, here I go, romanpitchler.com. So, and you can also download it, which is really great. So you don't have to actually mm-hmm. create it from scratch. Yeah. So I really like what he wrote. I think it makes sense. It's simple. It's easy to read. It's easy to understand. And I'm going to, I'm going to pimp it out. Yeah, it's very good. I, it, there's lots of good options, and we'll we'll link to some options that I've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, I did ask in the CSPO uh, LinkedIn group if what people kind of liked to do for their roadmaps, what they liked to kind of show, if they had a favorite format. Um, a lot of people said Trello, or one person said Trello. Um, I use PowerPoint for mine um, just because it's simple and easy, and I can get it done. Again, yes. we're not spending a lot of time on this. Uh, creatively, we're not, we're not going to make sure that it, you know, lines up to week four. It's again, it's a rough estimate. It's where we're headed. Um, so I like to put quarters and, and months on these. So depending on how long my roadmap is going to be, um, ideally I don't want it five years because that's ridiculous and everything's going to change in five years. Um, I usually go like to go in that six to 12 month range. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes if you're in a bigger organization, you may have to go out two years. Uh, but I wouldn't go out further than that. And I break it up so that you can see each quarter or each month, this is what we're releasing or this is what we're planning on releasing. All right. And speaking of seeing it, don't hide your roadmap. No, no, no. Be proud of it. The reason you're making this is to show everybody, your customers, your business, your team, and your users where you're headed. Yeah. And here's a little tip. Post it online so when you make changes to it, Everybody knows that changes are made. Yeah. So instead of just sending out an email or something, post it, you know, where you can track your changes. Yeah. And for the team, I put this above their board, their that's, work board. That's a good idea. And that way they, they understand where we're heading to. So they all know that we're heading east. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, so I, I don't put sprints on here. So I, I put like the months or the quarters, but I don't put sprints on there because, again, it's high level stuff. It's not low level. Low level, we have team boards for that and we have other mechanisms for roadmaps, we're just trying to explain, again, we're headed this way. Yep. Um, there are several tools. So I like PowerPoint. Other people like Trello. Uh, don't use Project. If you use Project, no. <laughs> you may have to use Project to translate what you're doing because your company requires it. Okay. We're sorry. I'll allow that. That's sad. I'm, I, I, I grieve for you. <laughs> but do your roadmap 
and something else. Um, there's several good tools coming online um, that have that understand the concept and are made by product people. Um, there's a good one called Aha. There's a very good one called Product Pad or Prod Pad. Uh, product plan is another one. And then again, there's, you can do it in Excel if you want to. You could do it in any low tech. Um, I know some of the tools like Jira and Rally and some of those tools are getting to the point where they can show a roadmap, but it's usually a roll up of everything they've got. So that epic level, they've rolled that up and they're starting to show that as a roadmap, which is not exactly the same thing, but it's a way to get there. You can also do it in Balsamic. You could do it in Balsamic. I know. Any kind of graphic program? Yeah, sure. Sure. You just like Balsamic. I love Balsamic. <laughs> I may have mentioned that once or twice. Yes, but it's very good. And again, have your roadmap. Have it high level. Visible. Next couple months out, what you're going to do, which direction you're going to have. Um, I usually change roadmaps after every sprint, depending on how we're doing. So if I'm doing a two-week sprint – and we have meetings and I talk to customers and something big changes. Um, if we're releasing every quarter, then I may change it every month. If we're releasing every month, I may change it every sprint, depending on the feedback that I'm getting. Um, the things further down the roadmap, things at the end of the roadmap will change more often than the things closer to us. Because, again, we should know what we're doing about two to four sprints ahead, depending on your release cycle. That's probably in the next month or so. I but, think the point, too, is that it's a living, breathing document. Yes. It's not static. Yeah. That's the reason that's not a commitment too, because again, this is where we're headed. This is not what we're going to deliver for that. You know, in six months, I don't know if we're going to deliver that, but that's the direction we're going to head and we'll figure out if we are actually going to do that or not. Agreed. Yay. Yay. Product roadmaps. roadmaps. They're fun. I like creating them. Yeah. You like the roadmaps. I do They're okay. because it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you don't like the roadmaps? They're right. Are you doing a roadmap now? Yes. Yes. Low tech roadmap? Is yeah, it in project? Yes. No. That look you gave me said it was in project. <laughs> no, it's definitely not in project. I okay, promise good. I promise you that. Uh, yes, we have a roadmap. Does each It's you- more or less in our heads. It's not really uh, written down. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Or maybe it's written down. I just don't have it in front of me. I, yes. I don't really know. But Get I know what we're working Get on. Get it public. Yes. Let everybody know. Yes. That's the thing that I've I've had. I've had it occur once that the team didn't understand where we were headed on the product. Because they were getting work ahead of the sprint, but they didn't see it because I didn't have a roadmap. And the reason I didn't have a roadmap is because there was so much chaos and there was so much uncertainty. And we were changing direction every couple months that it was hard to keep a roadmap. I mean, it was, it was one of these, we're heading south. Now we're headed east to turn. It was a right. complete shift. Mm-hmm. We kept the team together and we kept the technology similar, but we were changing directions because we were trying to build up our group and we were trying to build all kinds of things. And I couldn't have a roadmap because there was no, where are we going in three months? There right. was, it was where are we going in a month, you know, and maybe where are we going next week? Maybe I should have done that. But mm-hmm. again, it's not something I could have predicted because the business was changing. Um, you know, and maybe the right thing to do was, Hey, stop. Let's, no let's roadmap. figure out which way we are going to go. More security, yeah. Until we do the, till we go, do go there. Um, but the team didn't understand what they were doing and what they were working for. And that's what the roadmap for the team is for is, Hey, here's where we're going. Um, if they see that in six months they're going to be asked to work on something, they may say, oh, that technology would – this technology that we could adopt now would be really good for that and for the other things we've got going on now. So maybe we can talk about doing it that way. Maybe. That's a good point. But that lets them forward. see ahead instead mm-hmm. of just going, I'm just heads down working for today. That's a good point. Which is not the best. So. All right. Roadmaps. If roadmaps. you have questions, comments, roadmaps, let us know. There you go. There you go. So, as always, we're looking for feedback from our listeners. Yes. Any questions they may have in a peer space and problems that they're facing, any ideas for improvement, issues with the show itself. Yes, and you can find us online at DeliverItCast.com. On Twitter, we are at DeliverItCast. And you can email us 
at deliveracast at gmail.com. We don't have a question from a listener. However, one of the things that we've been thinking of doing is once we have some folks on, uh, I want to be able to ask some common questions of them. Um, if you ever listen to the Freakonomics podcast or read their series of books, which I highly recommend, um, they do something called Frequently Asked Questions. Um, and I've kind of a, I want to adopt some of that stuff, uh, and we're going to try one of them on each other. Okay. All right. You ready? Yes. So the question that we're going to ask each other, I'm going to ask you first. Okay. Just because I have the card in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, true. You do. And I can read it. So tell me about th- your three favorite apps or products that you use in your personal life and what you like about each one of them. Okay. So you told me you were going to ask me this question. Yes. I kind of prepared, but, you know, not really, as I, <laughs> as I usually go. So my top three, number one is Zillow. Zillow. So that's Real house estate. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I'm looking to, you know, sell my house and we're looking to buy something mm-hmm. someplace else. So I find myself on Zillow a lot. What I love about Zillow is that I can actually do a search in a particular area on the map. So I can zoom in, I can zoom out, I can move around and look at only those houses in that section. Yeah, it's got a really cool interface where you can just zoom around the map and have everything pop up for it's you. It's so easy. Yeah. It's really, really easy. Yeah. As soon as I find a house, I can select it. I can start looking through the pictures. When I'm done with it, I can just toss it and keep going back to my map. And I love Zillow. Yeah, it's really good. Mm-hmm. My second one is AnyDo. And it actually, it's any dot do. Any dot do, yes. I don't know why they put the dot there. Because they got the domain. They should call it Honeydew. <laughs> That's what they should have named yeah. it. I don't know why they didn't name it Honeydew. Well, who knows? So any do, in case anyone wants to know, is a to-do list. Mm-hmm. So you add your to-dos for the day or the week or you know, tomorrow or upcoming or some someday. And it allows you to track what you need to do. And then when you're done, you just swipe it through it and it crosses it out and it adds to a bucket of this is how many you've done. And there's a certain mm-hmm. sense of satisfaction of getting things done and seeing them crossed out. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a little OCD about it. So sometimes I'll have done the task <laughs> already, but then I'll go, I'll go back into my any do and I'll add it and then I'll cross it out. <laughs> just to go, look, I did something. <laughs> just to get that number up. <laughs> Very good. And then my third, I bet you can't guess which, what it is. <laughs> it's not an app, <laughs> is it? Is it? Cause it's not considered an app. No, it's a game. Oh, I was going to say Candy Crush. <laughs> you can say, Candy but now Crush. you've ruined it for me. Now that's actually fun. A real app <laughs> is have a Facebook. Can I use Facebook? I guess I like Facebook. Okay, because I like to keep up with things, and I may not post all the time, but I like to see what's happening with people, and I like to see who likes my page or my pictures. It's amazing how many people are getting their news and everything else from Facebook. By the way, don't go to Facebook today if you haven't watched the season finale of Game of Thrones. No, I'm not going to. I have not gone to Facebook. Actually, I did once until I read someone's posting that said, that was the worst ending ever. And I was like, oh, that's right today. I can't look at this until (laughs) I watch the show. So I'm stuck for probably about two or three days not getting on Facebook. Yeah. But I do love Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Those I mean, it's three. got some good features and some good items there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they're not all that genius, but I, I, I like those. But I mean, the, the point of the question is we're product people. What do we like about these products? What products or what problems do these products solve for mm. us? Or what do they allow us to do that is interesting and in a cool way? So Zillow, I think, is a really good example of that. House hunting is a chore, right? And there's, there's lots of choices and how do you narrow neighborhoods down and how do you narrow prices and square footage and yeah. how do you see clusters of things and it gives you all that in one view. I think a good app is an intuitive one. Yeah. I'm not hunting around trying to figure out how to use it. Yeah. You don't you have to learn. just know. Yeah. Exactly. And then you feel brilliant for just knowing how to use the yeah, app. Exactly. Nothing to do with their design. It's just that you're so smart. You, well, don't, the, you don't need training. And that's what that, <laughs> that, that badass book that I mentioned with Kathy. You said ask you, twice. I now. know. How do you get users to do that? How do you get them to learn your app quickly so they can do the thing they want to do? Yep. People don't know, want to be good at using Zillow. They want to find a house. Exactly. Right? Yes. So how do you get them to do that really quick and make them feel like, oh, I can search for anything. I can search this zip code, this price range, this square footage, and I can do all these things. That's what, very cool. So what are your three? So my three. Have you been doing research? Did you look through all your apps to come up to this answer? No, I, I this was 
off the top of my head, I knew okay. these things because okay. I use these three every single day. Um, the first one, so I have a problem um, in that I have too many tabs open on my browser, mm-hmm. both at work and at home. And the main reason I do that is because I find things I want to read. And I open it in a new tab and say, I'll read it later. And I'll read it later. And I'll read it later. And I'll read that later. And, oh, that's interesting. I'll read that later. And then, you know, three days have gone by and I've got 90 tabs open. <laughs> I told you I have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this app called Pocket is a read it later app. So basically I can take this link, I can shove it to Pocket. And then when I go into Pocket, it's got a magazine style of all these articles that I've said I wanted to read later. And it lets me read them in a browser. Let's read me. Uh, I can read it on my tablet or my phone or whatever. And once I'm done, I can check it and it goes away or I can favorite it and it goes into a favorites folder. Um, so that's real cool that it links across all those things. And it's a very quick right click link, send to pocket done. Mm -hmm. My browser count has gone dramatically down and I can keep up with what I want to read now. The other interesting thing that it does is that when it saves something to pocket, it saves the text. You actually have the text in there that you can read without the ads, without the images. So if you just want to read, it gives you a very plain version of that to read, get the information and you're gone. You can click a link to open the original and you can see the original article um, but you can't, yeah, but that's optional and it's very quick, very clean, very simple. Um, and I did a WebEx, uh, saw a WebEx where there were 17 people that make that app. Wow. It's fantastic. That's Read great. it later. It's called pocket. So pocket. it's very good. Uh, the other one I use is called sleep time. So I have a, I, I sleep a lot. I'm a very heavy sleeper. You sleep and read. I sleep. That's, all, that's all Corey does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned my osmosis. Um, but I have yet to find an alarm clock that wakes me up on a consistent basis. Mm. Um, sleep time. So you've heard about the, the scene Fitbits mm-hmm. and the sleep number beds that monitor your sleep. This is an app that does it, and it does it on your iPhone or your Android phone. You basically start the app. You tell it what time you want to wake up, and you leave it on face down on the corner of your bed, and it monitors your sleep. Basically how you're uh, turning and how you're moving, and it tells when you're in light sleep or deep sleep. And then when you're in light sleep, around the time you want to get up, it starts to wake you up. How? Sound. Gradually. Like sound. A screaming and it sound? No. It doesn't scream. <laughs> I'm sure you could put like a goat screaming on it if you really wanted to get up. <laughs> um, but it didn't. That was frightening. <laughs> I did it away from the mic. Hopefully yeah. I didn't blow any eardrums That's out. That's funny. But it starts to wake you up gradually. and It does it over a 30-minute period. So it tries to find when you're in light sleep. And then it tries to wake you up, and it actually works. But what, it's if, you're, what if you're in light sleep at like two in the morning? Is it trying to wake you up then? Are you telling it what time you actually I'd need? I say to wake I up? need to get up at about six, six right. whatever. And it says about five forty. Are you in light sleep? Any time in that thirty minute window, I'm going to try to wake you up, and it does. It's amazing. I don't know. I think that kind of sucks. It's waking you up before you actually want to get up. Yeah, but the the point is, you don't get jolted out of a deep sleep. And you're tired. You get gently woken up when oh, you're almost awake anyway. It's being kind. It's, it's, it's gentle. You, you wake up and you're actually kind of like, you're not just, oh, God, I, uh, you know. Huh. But it's very cool. All right. I like that one. And there's lots of things that do that, the sleep number bed and the Fitbit and all that. But I like that app if you don't want to buy all that crap. <laughs> and you just want to <laughs> sit on your you bed. You don't mean that, Corey. <laughs> what if they're one day our advertisers? Sleep number bed. We're not going to get it. Don't podcast, worry about it. Like and Corey. <laughs> um, so that's a very good one. It's called Sleep Time. Uh, and the last one I use called Waze. I know Waze. W A Z. I love Waze. I forgot about that Waze one. Waze is a traffic app. It's crowdsourced traffic problems, basically. So when you're driving around big cities and you have to drive around or through big cities, you're going to get uh, stuck in traffic. At some point, actually, you are going to become traffic. <laughs> you, you you're are not, the traffic. You're not in traffic. You are traffic. <laughs> um, but it gives you ways. Ways. I didn't mean to do that. That was actually very good. Damn it. Um, it gives you the capability. So when somebody's stuck on a road, they pop up and say, uh, you know, I'm going, there's a hazard, there's a fire, there's a wreck, there's whatever. There's a cop. There's a cop. That's the best. And... If you put in your destination, like if you're going to work from home, you can put in your your um, your address and it'll route you 
there the quickest way. So it'll route you around accidents. It'll route you around traffic jams or show you alternate routes to get somewhere. And I'm one of these people that I would rather drive five miles out of my way as long as I'm moving than sit somewhere still for 10 minutes. I'm the same way. Uh, right. I want to mm-hmm. keep moving because I want to feel some type of progress. So I'd much rather do that. And that's what the app lets me do is when 440 is backed up or when there's a wreck somewhere, then I can just go right around it. It tells me, go this way. Now go this way. The best part about Waze is it's kind of like a tattletale application. Yeah. So if there's a like hidden cop somewhere, you'll know if somebody was going to pop in. They're going to go cop right out to the overpass or whatever. And then you know you need to slow down because there's a cop there. Yeah, and they've gotten in some trouble for that too. Who has ways? Well, but specifically because they're trying to out cops. Well, they are outing the cops. Yeah. But that's, I mean, again. That's what makes it genius. There's, there's specific apps for doing that too, which is kind of weird. <laughs> But the reason I like it is because of the traffic, because trying to get somewhere in the morning when I leave work and I have to go drop off the kids, I have to go do something else, and then I have to go get to work, I don't want to get here in you know 50 minutes. I want to get here in about 25, and this lets me do it, and yep. it works, Ways and it's is great. free, mm-hmm. and it's crowdsourced, and it's very good. So the bigger your city, the more likely uh, you're going to get better updates and better um, traffic, but it's really cool. Really good. So Pocket... Sleep time and ways. Very nice. Yay. So if you have good apps that you like, dear listener, send them to us. Let us know what you like about them. Um, and we'll talk about them because I like talking about apps. That was fun. They're fun. Yeah, that was a good one. Yay. All right. All right. Anything else? Not for me. I think we got it. All right. What are we going to talk about next time? Oh, I don't know. What do you want to talk about next time? Hmm. We're, we're dodging the estimation topic. Let's do it. I don't think we're dodging it. Yeah. <laughs> It's just such a big topic, right? Well, maybe we can break it down. It's so hairy. could be scary. It's, we can talk it really about, isn't. We can talk about it a little bit. Okay. Well, let's, I have to look and see. It. Estimations and option. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll have to look and see what else is up. I there. would like to have some some people, uh, some guests. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. We'll have to so look, You look guests. into that. Okay. <laughs> you look into that. <laughs> You're the one with all the free time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading books. Uh-huh. All right, I'll give you a disclaimer. (laughs) These words are our own and are not endorsed or representative of any company or organization. You can find me online at IsCoreyBright on Twitter or in frequently blogging at don'tyellme.wordpress.com. And as always, I can be reached through the show's contact information. And we just delivered episode nine. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we will talk to you next time. Bye. See ya.